JFK, in sickness and by stealth. Review of an unfinished life, John F. Kennedy, 1917-1963, by Robert Dalek. Times Literary Supplement, August the 22nd, 2003. Even as I was grazing on the easy slopes of this book in June and July, the Quotidian Press brought me fairly regular updates on the doings and undoings of the fabled Kennedy dynasty. A new volume by Ed Klein, portentously titled The Kennedy Curse, revealed the brief marriage of John Kennedy Jr. and Carolyn Bessette to have been a cauldron of low-level misery, infidelity and addiction. The political matrimonial alliance between Andrew Cuomo and Kerry Kennedy was discovered to be in the process of acrimonious dissolution. Representative Patrick Kennedy of Rhode Island, whose ability to find his way to the House unaided has long been a source of intermittent wonder, became inflamed while making a speech at a liberal fundraising event and yelled, I don't need Bush's tax cut. I have never worked a fucking day in my life. The electoral career of Kathleen Kennedy Townsend, which had never achieved escape velocity from local Maryland politics, seemed to undergo a final eclipse in the last midterm vote. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. failed to convince anyone of the innocence of his cousin Michael Skakel, convicted of beating a teenage girlfriend to death with a golf club. Senator Edward Kennedy of Massachusetts still retains a certain grandeur on the grounds of longevity and persistence alone, but his solidity on the landscape derives in part from his resemblance, pitilessly identified by his distant kinsman Gore Vidal, to 300 pounds of condemned veal. And even Vidal, who first broke a lance against the Kennedy clan with his 1967 essay The Holy Family, might be open-mouthed at the possibility of Arnold Schwarzenegger winning the upcoming race for the governorship of California and thereby making Maria Shriver, a collateral Kennedy descendant, the first lady of the nation's richest and most populous state. Such a macho Republican triumph would be a bizarre way for the family charisma to mutate. Or would it? Not if you bear in mind Vidal's phrase about the tribe's cold-blooded jauntiness. The calculated combination of sex, showbiz, money and bravado was, as Robert Dalek unwittingly demonstrates in an unfinished life, the successful if volatile mixture all along. Otherwise, one can reasonably look forward to a future where the entire meretricious Kennedy cult has staled. It's already more or less meaningless to younger Americans, and even those like myself who are near contemporary with all the verbiage and imagery of the New Frontier, or even worse, Camelot, have had the opportunity to become bored, sated, and better informed. Pierre Salinger and Oliver Stone, votaries of the cult, have spun off into the bliss that comforts and shields the paranoid. Arthur Schlesinger Jr. and Theodore Sorensen, the officially consecrated historians, are, one feels, at last reaching an actuarial point of diminishing returns. Meanwhile, the colossal images of September the 11th, 2001, have easily deposed the squalid scenes in Dallas of the murders of Kennedy and Oswald, which once supplied the bond of a common televised melodramatic experience. This is not to say that hair and nails do not continue to sprout on the corpse. Professor Dalek's title, itself portentous and platitudinous at the same time, is part of the late growth. Since President Kennedy was shot dead at the age of 46, it is self-evidently true in one way to describe his life as unfinished. But anyone scanning this or several other similar accounts would have to be astonished not that the man's career was cut short, but rather that it lasted so long. In addition to being a moral defective and a political disaster, John Kennedy was a physical and probably mental also ran for most of his presidency. Even someone impervious to his supposed charm has to feel a piercing pang of pity when reading passages such as this one. Despite the steroids he was apparently taking, he continued to have abdominal pain and problems gaining weight. Backaches were a constant problem. He also had occasional burning when urinating, which was the result of a non-specific urethritis dating from 1940 and a possible sexual encounter in college, which left untreated, became a chronic condition. 
He was later diagnosed as having a mild, chronic, non-specific prostatitis that sulfur drugs temporarily suppressed. Moreover, a strenuous daily routine intensified the symptoms, fatigue, nausea and vomiting, of the Addison's disease that would not be diagnosed until 1947. This was the state of affairs when the young Jack, pressed and driven by his gruesome tyrant of a father, first ran for a seat in Congress in 1946. Obviously, a good deal of spin is required to make an Achilles out of such a poxed and separating philoctetes. The difference was supplied by family money in heaping measure by the canny emphasis on a war record and by serious attention to the flattery and suborning of the media. As Dalek is the latest to concede, the boy wonder later had a Pulitzer Prize procured for him for a superficial book he had hardly read, let alone written. One doesn't want to overstress the medical dimension, but it is the truly macabre extent of disclosure on that front that constitutes this book's only claim to originality. At the very time of the Bay of Pigs disaster, Kennedy struggled with constant acute diarrhoea and a urinary tract infection. His doctors treated him with increased amounts of antispasmodics, a puree diet and penicillin, and scheduled him for a sigmoidoscopy. During the next crisis over Cuba, the nuclear confrontation in the autumn of 1962, we learn that the president took his usual doses of antispasmodics to control his colitis, antibiotics for a flare-up of his urinary tract problem and a bout of sinusitis and increased amounts of hydrocortisone and testosterone as well as salt tablets to control his Addison's disease. On November the 2nd, he took 10 additional grams of hydrocortisone and 10 grams of salt to boost him before giving a brief report to the American people on the dismantling of the Soviet missile bases in Cuba. In December, Jackie asked the president's gastroenterologist, Dr. Russell Bowles, to eliminate antihistamines for food allergies. She described them as having a depressing action on the president and asked Bowles to prescribe something that would ensure mood elevation without irritation to the gastrointestinal tract. Bowles prescribed one milligram twice a day of stelazine, an antipsychotic that was also used as an anti-anxiety medication. Further mind-boggling revelations are given and it becomes clearer and clearer that Dalek wants the credit for the disclosures without allowing any suggestion that they might qualify his hero worship for the subject. Thus, and again in lacerating detail from the previously secret medical records of another of his numerous physicians, Dr. Janet Travell. During the first six months of his presidency, stomach, colon and prostate problems, high fevers, occasional dehydration, abscesses, sleeplessness and high cholesterol accompanied Kennedy's back and adrenal ailments. Medical attention was a fixed part of his routine. His physicians administered large doses of so many drugs that they kept an ongoing medicine administration record, MAR, cataloging injected and oral corticosteroids for his adrenal insufficiency, procaine shots to painful trigger points, ultrasound treatments and hot packs for his back, Lomatil, Metamucil, Paragoric, Phenobarbital, testosterone and transentine to control his diarrhoea, abdominal discomfort and weight loss, penicillin and other antibiotics for his urinary infections and abscesses, and tuonil to help him sleep. To this pharmacopoeia, Dalek somewhat fatuously adds that, though the treatments occasionally made him feel groggy and tired, Kennedy did not see them as a problem. He thus perpetuates the fealty required by and of the JFK school, which insists that we judge Kennedy more or less as he judged himself. Plain evidence is available on neighbouring pages that this would be simplistic or foolish in the extreme. Dr. Travell and her colleagues did not know that their famous patient had a secret relationship with yet another doctor who flew on another plane. As early as the election campaign of 1960, this revelation is not original to Dalek, Kennedy had begun seeing Dr. Max Jacobson, the New York physician who had made a reputation for treating celebrities with pep pills or amphetamines that help combat depression and fatigue. Jacobson, whom patients termed Dr. Feelgood, 
administered back injections of painkillers and amphetamines that allowed Kennedy to stay off crutches, which he believed essential to project a picture of robust good health. The clumsy phrasing here makes it slightly obscure whether Kennedy or Jacobson was nurturing the image, but it was clearly the candidate himself. Even on the day of his celebrated inaugural speech, he worried that his steroid-inflated face would be too fat and puffy for the cameras, and was saved by a swift Palm Beach suntan. This false projection of youthful vigour was more than narcissism. It was the essence of the presentation, and had been the backdrop to his wild accusation of a missile gap between the Soviet Union and the USA, neglected by the wrinkly and tired Eisenhower regime. Also, and unlike, say, Franklin Roosevelt's polio, the concealment was of a serious condition, or set of conditions, that might really affect performance in office. If Kennedy had not succumbed to his actual ill health, he might as easily have flamed out like Jimi Hendrix or Janis Joplin from the avalanche of competing uppers and downers that he was swallowing. But the furthest that Dalek will go here is to admit, following Seymour Hersh's earlier book, The Dark Side of Camelot, that Kennedy's back brace held him upright in the open car in Dallas, unable to duck the second and devastating bullet from Lee Harvey Oswald. This is almost the only connection between the President's health and his fitness that is allowable in these pages, and I presume that it is its relative blamelessness which allows the concession. On other pages, Dalek flatly, if unconsciously, contradicts his own soothing analysis. Judging from tape recordings of conversations made during the crisis, the medications were no impediment to long days and lucid thought. To the contrary, Kennedy would have been significantly less effective without them and might not have been able to function. Consider for yourself how reassuring is that. Elsewhere, we learn that during the disastrous summit with Khrushchev in Vienna, a long day under much tension certainly accounts for most of Kennedy's weariness by the early evening. But we cannot discount the impact of the Jacobson chemicals on him as well. As the day wore on, and an injection Jacobson had given him just before he met Khrushchev wore off, Kennedy may have lost the emotional and physical edge initially provided by the shot. This is no small matter, because the sense that Kennedy retained of having been outdone by Khrushchev in their first man-to-man -man confrontation decided him to show resolve in the worst of all possible locations, which was Vietnam. A mere 63 pages later, Dalek simply states without qualification that personal problems added to the strains of office testing Kennedy's physical and emotional endurance. His health troubles were a constant strain on his ability to meet presidential responsibilities. The other personal problems, which Dalek also approaches with a combination of fawning and concession, are at least suggested by the injections of testosterone mentioned above. This was notoriously a department in which Kennedy did not require any extra boost. We learn again from this book about the way in which he regularly humiliated his wife abused his staffers and secret servicemen by suborning them as procurers and endangered the security of his administration by fornicating with a gun mole, the property of the mafia boss Sam Giancana, in the White House. But Dalek almost outpoints Schlesinger himself in the deployment of euphemism here. Did Kennedy's compulsive womanizing distract him from public business? Some historians think so, especially when it comes to Vietnam. Kennedy's reluctance, however, to focus the sort of attention on Vietnam he gave to Berlin or other foreign and domestic concerns is not evidence of a distracted president, but of a determination to keep Vietnam from becoming more important to his administration than he wished it to be. Certainly, when one reviews Kennedy's White House schedules, he does not seem to have been derelict about anything he considered a major problem. But the supposition that he was too busy chasing women or satisfying his sexual passions to attend to important presidential business is not borne out by the record of his daily activities. And according to Richard Reeves, another Kennedy historian, the womanizing generally took less time than tennis. One is forced into a bark of mirth by the way that bathos succeeds banality here. Forget the fact already admitted that some of Kennedy's health problems originated with a clinging and neglected case of VD. A solemn review of the official appointment book is supposed to show no trace of strenuous venery, 
and thus to rule it out as a problem. While this non-evidence is allegedly buttressed by the assertion that the tennis court was as much of an arena as the boudoir. We're not here really comparing like with like. And if record-keeping is to count as evidence, then what of the numerous holes and gaps in the White House taping system that Kennedy secretly installed? Dalek does his best to explain these away, admitting in the process that the excisions probably involve assassination plots against Castro, as well as involvement with Marilyn Monroe and with Judith Campbell Exner, Giancarlo's girlfriend. The Kennedy Library remains as hermetic as ever, withholding the transcripts of four missing tapes, which may contain embarrassing revelations or national security secrets. Wrong-footing himself at almost every step, Dalek lamely concludes that, by and large, however, the tapes seem to provide a faithful record of some of the most important events in Kennedy's presidency. By and large, the same could be said of the Nixon tapes, too. Like many of his fellow devotees, Dalek rests a tentative defense on what might have been. The speech at American University about ultimate disarmament or the possibility that reason might have prevailed in Indochina, always given the chance of a second term. Why is it not recognized with Kennedy that the job of the historian is to record and evaluate what actually did happen? And why is it forgotten that, had he lived... Kennedy would necessarily have been even more distressingly ill than he was already. The usual compromise is to invest with a retrospective numinousness the relative banality of what did occur. Thus Dalek relates the set-piece events with the customary awe, the brinkmanship over Cuba, the Ich bin ein Berliner speech, the confrontations with revolution in Vietnam and the Congo. Tougher scholarship has dimmed the phony glamour of most of these recovered memories. Michael Beschloss's crisis years demonstrated in 1991 that Kennedy was, for most practical purposes, complicit in the erection of the Berlin Wall, played it down as an issue wherever possible, and only made his defiant public speech when he was quite sure that it could make no difference. As in the case of Cuba, he first created the conditions for a crisis by using inflamed rhetoric and tactics, then just managed to extricate himself from catastrophe and finally agreed to a consolidation of communist power that was much more locked in than it had been before. Whether you approach matters from the standpoint of those concerned with nuclear holocaust and superpower promiscuity, or of those desiring a long-term strategy to outlast the Stalinist monolith, this record is a dismal one. It was further punctuated by episodes of more or less gangsterish conduct, most conspicuously in the coup that murdered Kennedy's South Vietnamese client, Ngo Dinh Dam, but also in such vignettes as Robert Kennedy's serious proposal to blow up the American consulate in the Dominican Republic in order to supply a pretext for a U.S. invasion. Dalek allows this latter moment all of two sentences. Their hysterical and profitless hyperactivity on one front is in the boldest contrast to the millimetrical trudging and grudging with which the Kennedy brothers approach their genuinely urgent and constitutionally mandated responsibility for civil rights. Confronted with an inescapable matter, they abandon the flamboyance of their overseas melodramas and confine themselves to the most minimal Fabian tactics. Since Robert Kennedy was at least physically robust, it may not be fair to attribute this mood-swing regime too intimately to the influence of stimulants and analgesics. But as Robert Dalek inadvertently shows, it would be highly imprudent to discard the hypothesis altogether. The reputation of the Kennedy racket is now dependent on a sobbing effort of will, an applauding chorus demanding that the flickering Tinkerbell not be allowed to expire. It is pardonable for children to yell that they believe in fairies, but it is somehow sinister when the piping note shifts from the puerile to the senile. End of Disc 2